The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Schrodinger's collaborators caught it in the act, but wouldn't you know it, they also get away with it. Underhill rocked by revelation that limbas taste so good because they're barbecued with unicorn horn charcoal. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We talk with David Weber, Timothy Zahn, and Thomas Pope again this time in part two of a two-part interview discussing A Call to Vengeance, the latest entry in the Manticore Ascendant science fiction series set in David Weber's Honorverse. The action occurs about 300 years prior to Honor Harrington's time and is about the era when the wormhole junction was found in the uh, vicinity of Manticore. It's a wide-ranging, insightful discussion and lots of fun, so stay tuned for that. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Leaden Universe novel, Alliance of Equals. First, here's the news. Well, 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 look out, Universe. After much deliberation and percolation, the Bain editors, including yours truly, and special guest judge, author David Drake, have made their choice. Stephen Lawson of Louisville, Kentucky, has won the grand prize in the 2018 Jim Bain Memorial Award competition for a short story, Homunculus. The Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Contest has been held annually since 2007. That's 11 years and is open to all levels of experience. Stephen Lawson is no stranger to the contest. He was first runner-up in 2017. I met him at the ISDC in St. Louis, and he's a really great guy and a fine writer. Now, one of the interesting aspects of the contest is that all the stories are judged anonymously, so I had no idea it was Stephen who won until after we'd made the selections. The contest is focused on stories of human space exploration and discovery with an optimistic spin. First runner-up in this year's contest is also a great story, Dangerous Company, by C. Stewart Hardwick of Houston, Texas. And the second runner-up is Falling to the Moon by Wendy Nickel of Layton, Utah. The Jim Bain Memorial Award will be presented May 26, 2018, in a ceremony at the annual International Space Development Conference held this year in Los Angeles, California. This year it will be presented by Tony Weisskopf, my boss. The winner receives professional publication of the story in June 2018 at the Bain.com website. The National Space Society and Bain Books applaud the role that science fiction plays in advancing real science and have teamed up to sponsor the short fiction contest in memory of Bain Books founder Jim Bain. It's a wonderful opportunity for the winner to meet scientists and space advocates from around the world. By the way, our contest administrator, Bill Ledbetter, who does an amazing job sorting through all the initial entries, is also a Nebula Award winner for his short fiction. So congrats to Stephen Lawson. We'll see him at the International Space Development Conference in Los Angeles in May, and you can read his excellent story, Homunculus, here come June 15th at the Bain.com website. This is part two of a two-part interview with David Weber, Timothy Zahn, and Thomas Pope. Part one of the interview is available on last week's podcast. Well, welcome. David Weber, Timothy Zahn, and Thomas Pope to the podcast. Hello, fellas. Hi. Hello. Hi, Tony. David Weber is the creator of the internationally best-selling Honor Harrington series and the Honorverse, within which that series is set. David has many New York Times bestsellers, and there are over 8 million David Weber books in print. Timothy Zahn is a Hugo Award winner and author of the New York Times number one bestseller, Heir to Empire, and many other Star Wars books as well. And uh, he is, of course, the author of the Cobra series here at Bain, born in Chicago, he earned a B.S. in physics from Michigan State and M.S. in physics from the University of Illinois. Bain published his popular Cobra trilogy in one volume. Tim continued the series with his Cobra War trilogy and the Cobra Rebellion series, which just finished up. His other popular series include the Conqueror and Dragonback novels and 
Tom, Tom Pope, is the founder of View 9, a collection of professionals assisting David Weber in defining and documenting the Honorverse. Tom serves as lead editor for House of Steel, which is uh, the Honorverse companion, and is collaborating with David and Timothy Zahn on the books that we are talking about today, the Manticore Ascendant series. Tom also works with robots at uh, Carnegie uh, Mellon University. Is that correct? That's right, Tom. That is, that is correct. In fact, I just got back from a competition. Ah, cool. And out now at Booksellers, I, I could mention many other David Weber series as well, but uh, let's just get on with uh, with talking about Manticore Ascendant. Out now at Booksellers is the third entry in the Manticore Ascendant series, which is A Call to Vengeance by David Weber and Timothy Zahn with Thomas Pope. I, I actually had somebody come up to me and she said, you have ruined my son for Star Wars. And I said, excuse me? And she said, yes, he just got back from watching one of the Star Wars movies and he turned around to me and he said, where are the logistics? And I said, Many yes, of us feel that way. You know, who builds these ships? Who supplies the kind of thing? You know, and to me, you know, you don't need to 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 drag the reader, you know, through the shipyards in in every book, but the characters, the the officers who are making their decisions and so forth, have to be cognizant of okay, what's our ammunition supply look like? Okay, like Tim was saying, you know, they might as well be made out of platinum in in Travis's time. Okay, it's like you have to sweat blood over every ammunition expenditure. Um, and it's it's not like um, I think it was H. Beam Piper in the Uller Uprising has uh, his military commander uh, say, you know, some junior officers seem to feel that ammunition supply comes down and shuttles from orbit by an act of God whenever you need it. And it doesn't work that way. And the honorverse, you know, you have to be you have to be aware of that. Um, I would say that one of the things that I like uh, about um, where Tim is with uh, with Travis and uh, uh, and Lisa, even more than Chomps, I think Travis and Lisa is uh, their interaction with um, other star nations when they are obviously the new kids on the block, rather than Honor Harrington being the representative of the star nation that dominates the commerce of the galaxy. Um, and I'm, I'm really been watching that whole um, relationship evolving because it's evolving a lot more. Um, it's evol evolving a lot more Timish than Davidish. Um, if, <laughs> if, well, because, and I wanted it that way. Okay, I didn't want Travis to be Honor Harrington 300 years earlier. I wanted him to be somebody else, um, and I wanted him to have a different set of constraints. And Tim and Tom have done me proud um, in in that respect. Um, like I say, Travis is one of my favorite characters, even though I didn't get to create him. Um, and I I I. I've had uh, a hand in, you know, some of his some of his evolution, but it's been more of a where the character and the institution collide, uh, because there are some aspects of him as an officer, because of the nature of the organization that he is in, where you kind of have to go a little more one way than another way, uh, but. More mostly where Travis is concerned, I just sit back and go, "Oh, Travis!" <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> when he heads into yet another of his Travis moments, <laughs> and and sometimes the fact that we come at this differently actually adds enormously to the final novel. Uh, Tim uh, and Tom, I'm thinking here about his relationship with Clegg and that whole special order. Yeah in the in the book yep. mm -hmm. um it it turned into one of the strong points of the book from having been a well, I don't know about this kind of moment um I was very pleased with how that whole relationship worked out um 
in in the end. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that it was a comfortable relationship for Travis, but I'm just saying that it it evolved in a way that made really good sense, and I think really pushes the entire evolution of the Navy thread um, in in the stories. Well, if they're, um, I would I'd like to ask you about the bad guys and who they encounter, but uh, that is also a question. If there were an RMN uh, intelligence, naval intelligence force that needed to come into place, what would that look like? <laughs> and how would it, uh, let's let's stipulate that, that 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 perhaps happens in this book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's stipulate, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. I won't make any promises. Um, well, well, like I, everything I, I else, know. they're feeling their way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like everything else, they're feeling their way. They're they're starting basically from scratch. They're trying to fumble into this, just like the Navy is is doing in many ways. So we're going to get to watch evolution of that kind of branch of the service as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they need well, it because they also, they're not sure who the hell is attacking them, right? Yeah, they don't have a clue uh, not uh, sure initially. At all. all they all they know is somebody just shot up our star system. Um, yeah, I think um, one of the things that needs to be borne in mind by readers looking at this situation is that when I refer to the Star Kingdom of Travis's birth as Denmark, in terms of the Star Kingdom's heft in the galaxy, that actually overstates. It's more like Iceland than Denmark, uh, but it's in an era of sailing ships, so that uh, transmission of information and so forth takes months or years in the honorverse uh, at this, especially at this stage, pre pre wormhole, pre you know people doing routinely doing the hyper bridge transits rather than going through hyperspace. Um, so there really is no need for an office of naval intelligence prior to the events that begin to unfold when the, the existence of the wormhole junction is suspected by the bad guys. So obviously there isn't a naval intelligence organization. And when you have to put one together by a bunch of amateurs with no experience, you get a few false steps here and there. What can I say? And that's not entirely fair. There is an office of naval intelligence, but it's about six old guys sitting in an office reading old like Solarian tech magazines and, and defense journals. Um, it's yeah, it's, solely and concerned the defense with, journals and the magazines are at least eight months out of date yeah, before they exactly. get them. <laughs> uh, but the, by, the idea of yeah, the idea of actually sort of a threat analysis and and that kind of thing really, the Star Star Kingdom didn't have a foreign policy because they didn't need one. Um, and yeah. now when they realize they need to have a foreign policy, they also realize they might need to know what people want to do to them before they start making policy. <laughs> Figure out what to do to them first, yeah. Well, I, I think that the the naval intelligence of, of Travis's birth navy, if you were, um, is more involved in keeping abreast of the Joneses in terms of all the technology we'd really like to have if we only had the money to keep the ships we have running, uh, rather than a who out there might want to shoot at us, because obviously no one does. Okay. Yep. Um, the only, the, Tom, um, address for a minute how the Royal Manticoran Navy came into existence in the first place. Well, it became Why do we have one? The, we have one because we started with the Manticore System Navy, the tiny little set of frigates that were just holding the – basically holding their place in line before the colonists got there. Um, but mm-hmm. we – you know, the Navy the Navy itself, before even – you know, before it was the Star Kingdom, the Navy came out of the initial attacks from the pre-Brotherhood, and they realized that they – didn't have what they needed. They didn't have the people. They didn't have the machinery. They didn't have the, the firepower to deal with this roam, roaming band of sort of warlike nomads. And so they bought one. They they sent off to the Solarian League. They said, "Give us a navy. We want the ships, the people, the, the infrastructure, the whole batch." Uh, so even before we saw the initial influx of colonists from the um, post-plague, Manticore actually mm-hmm. had about. 
10, 15,000 colonists because the Navy and all of their families and all the technicians to run the ships and everybody, basically they bought the whole mess. Uh, and it really added a culture shock to the, 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 um, the Manticore colony at the time. It wasn't the Star Kingdom at the time as they sort of add these new people with their new ideas who, oh, by the way, also saved them from, uh, from the free brotherhood that was coming rampaging through and mm-hmm. yeah. bumped into the Manticore enough times to realize that, nope, we're going to go elsewhere. And then they bumped into Haven yeah. and got smooshed. But. <laughs> well, you know, you, but sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. Um, <laughs> the, yeah. but, okay, Manticore had a potential existential threat when they bought what Tom refers to as the Navy in a box. Uh, and they had a huge bank account back on old Earth for reasons that – make perfectly good sense from inside the, the, the book. So it was actually, they were actually capable to pay cash on the barrel head for this, for this Navy, which is huge compared to anybody else out in the fringe at the time that they assemble it. I mean, it really is. Uh, but by the time we're a hundred years further down the road, the ships are now obsolescent. There hasn't been a threat in a hundred years. This is pre prolonged, so a hundred years is five generations. Uh, you know, there's plenty of time for the ha- habit of thought of we may, you know, yes, we're Denmark, but you know what? Uh, maybe we're more like Ireland, and they're going to come raid the monasteries. Uh, I mean, you know, there's there's room for that thinking to 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 die a natural death before Travis yep. comes yep. along and then you have a, a fresh threat. So it's it's been a lot of fun to me to watch the evolution of things that I knew were there in the background of the universe, but I had never gotten around to, to turning into concrete details because I didn't need them yet. And they're turning into concrete details under Tom and Tim's ministration over here. And I basically sit there and I say, Oh, wow, this is cool because I watch the outlines going back and forth, you know, and then the, 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 the manuscript starts going back and forth. And I do my best to really and truly stay hands off um, as much as I can um, at, uh, until we're looking at like the final edit and so forth. If I see a direction going that I think is, well, you know, this is going to make trouble down the road because, you know, then I'll, 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 insert that into the discussion at an early point. But by and large, I really want Tom and Tim to write these books because for reasons that I think this entire conversation should make clear, I really, really trust and respect their judgment. Um, and I think they've done very well by the honor verse here. I genuinely do. Well, uh, since we're talking about process, um, Tom and Tim, um, what is it what is it like to to have this uh, vast but somebody else's um, uh, original conception uh, to deal with um, as you're trying to create, you know, make creative work happen? Tim, I'll let you start that one. All, all the detail, uh-huh. yeah, all the detail that David has put in means a lot less uh, wiggle room for oh convenient or you know uh, easy solutions to things i have started more than one email to tom with curse you and your stupid laws of physics and your ridiculously <laughs> over engineered warships <laughs> Because he wouldn't let me break something as easily as I wanted to, and we had to find a better way of breaking something, <laughs> which of course does make for a better book. Yeah, it, 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 it but uh, I, I think yeah, our process it, and all the details. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I do think the process can be painful for for Tim at times because I, I, I have this picture. We we have different pictures in our heads about where where warships should break. That's a big. <laughs> That's a big discussion of ours. Um, and I, not I should try they break really or not, hard. just where? Yeah. I, I try really hard to to make my answers not always be no. Um, like, no, we can't do that. But, uh, you know, I try to, to say no, but let's try this. But sometimes we've, we've run into places where it's just we, we can't figure out how to find the way to make. And it's hard. It's really hard to find because we have um, – 
you know, my job in this process is to make certain that we, you know, the technology is working and we're sort of keeping, you know, keeping to the history and keeping to the canon and, and, and you know, sort of following the, the infrastructure that, that we're building. Um, but it, really fundamentally what that means is my job is to make Tim's job harder. Um, <laughs> and I always feel bad about that. <laughs> Yeah. But you do it so well. Now, yeah, but we get, I, I would say, <laughs> we get better books that way, though. I think so. I think so. I, yeah, I, I would say this, too. I did, I've been – go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was ahead. just saying that um, typically I would get you know, four no's and a well from Tom, and I've learned to jump on that well and uh, <laughs> explore some deeper – <laughs> and we, we've come up with some good good solutions that way. Well, and they've come up with some solutions that is sometimes redefine the problem, uh, which can be good for the books too. I've I've been thinking in terms of you know honor versus constraints on maneuvers and so forth for for twenty five years now, um, uh, closer to closer to thirty when you add the lead time to write the first two books. Um, and so one of the problems is that Tim is more lately come to to the honorverse, and he's done more in like the Star Wars and 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 that situation where the physical constraints are different. Um, and so sometimes we're faced with a situation where I know how the situation that he set up in the story begins and how it has to end. And it's my job to go into the tactics and so forth of the battle and figure out how to get from point A to point B, which is not always the way that Tim originally envisioned. And I think that that is another point where the the divergence of approach strengthens the book because he and I have to work together to deal with the storytelling constraints that he needs versus the how do I get that outcome out of this situation that I can build on the other side. And so in a way, I'm in my universe, but I'm playing in somebody else's when that part of the book rolls around, which is kind of cool. Um, because, you know, sometimes I'm like, Tim, why do you want to do that? You know, but okay, here's how we can do it. Uh, and other times I'm like, that is so cool. And we can do it this way. Um, and every so often it's like Tim and Tom will be having a discussion. They'll be going back and forth about, well, I'm not sure how we can do this, how we can do that. And I'll say, well, what if we try doing it this way? Um, and they'll go, oh, okay, that'll work. Um, which is the wonderful thing about a collaborative process when all three of the collaborators bring something really important to the table and they respect one another. Um, yeah. And and I think that's a big part of the reason these books are as strong as they are. Yeah. But, uh, but Tim, you're, you're never just tempted to use the force, right? <laughs> 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 well, yeah, I mean, a, we basically have that. It's called a wedge. Oh, that's true. Yes. That's true. That's right. true. Those wedges. For... It's the mystical yeah, energy we're... field that protects us from getting shot at from above and below. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yes. Yeah. Um, that is. Uh, you, there's. Yeah. yeah it's, there, and there's there's a light side and a dark side. You know, on the outside, the light yeah. has not yet been bent. On the inside, it's much darker. Um, I had I had really thought of that, Tim, but you're absolutely right. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'll tell you another huge difference between these books and the Honor Harrington books. No tree cats in the Navy anywhere. We don't have a single character in here who's bonded to a tree cat yet at any rate. Um, and we won't have any naval officers who are bonded to a tree cat because we haven't had Queen Adrian lay down the law yet uh, on that uh, that aspect of things. So it, it that's a a big part in some ways of the different flavor of these books, because I really didn't realize the extent to which the tree cats were going to become uh, a dominant element uh, in the, in the storyline. 
even at honors in honors time. Um, and there are none here. I mean, you know, if there are the Stephanie novels, which I'd like to do more of, uh, where we could we could work with some of this and maybe have some some uh, some crossover characters. Um, but um, I was thinking about that um, when I was reading through the the author's copy of of this book when I got it. I was thinking, there's not a single tree cat in here. They're not even mentioned. Yeah. That is so cool. <laughs> where where is uh, where is Stephanie? Um, the uh, the um, uh, what is that series called? Uh, the Star Kingdom um, series. Where is it yeah, in the timeline yeah. in comparison to this book? A slightly earlier. Tom, you're, um, yeah, like forty years. I think it might be a little bit. Sooner than that, but it's definitely earlier. I have to actually pull out my yeah. master timeline. This is why yeah. many of my calls with David involve me opening lots of spreadsheets. Yeah. Um, I have about five open yeah. right now. Um, <laughs> that, like that is, that's and, when the tree cats are that are discovered to be sentient. And, yeah. and that's the yeah. main point of that series, yeah. in fact. Yeah, the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution, the one that recognizes their sentience and reserves, like I think, a third of the planet to them in perpetuity, uh, is sort of the the crowning achievement of Stephanie's life uh, when she's in her 80s, when she finally gets the amendment on the books. Um, and that's got to overlap. Travis considerably. She overlaps with Travis, yeah. but not by too much. I remember this discussion. I don't remember how many years. Yeah, but yeah. yeah there is some overlap. Twenty five, not too yeah, much. Right, right. Right now, it's twenty five years after Stephanie was adopted. So she's going to be okay. Thirty six odd years old. I think she was like eleven when she was adopted. Yeah. So she's you know she's yeah. she's well established now. She's on space. She's, she's actually campaigning and. Um, I mean, she's a, she's probably a you know a somewhat big name on Sphinx, at least in, in her circle, where she's um, advocating yeah. for tree cat rights and, and the things that she's done yeah. with this forestry service. Um, and we, yeah. um, you know, we might start to see a tree cat here and there, but it would definitely be off of Sphinx. Would be a a, a um, there'd be a lot of well, Chomps, you know, a lot of people watching. Chops Chops would be our natural window into that. Since he yeah. is a Sphinxian, yeah. and therefore presumably has a lot of relatives on Sphinx, but that means that mm. she's actually close to the same age that Travis is, because she's thirty-six. Yeah. He's what? It is late thirties at the end of this. I think so. I have to find his. Yeah. To find his own timeline here. Wow. See, this is one of the well. cool, this is one of the kind of cool conversations we have when we're working on the books. It sounds because like you're making the next one up. up. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody listen. We're discussing plot details, you know. Um, but I mean, this this is how it works. Um, when when you know Tim and Tom and I'll get on a on a on a conference call on Skype or something, and we'll be like, well, what if we did this? What if we did that? Um, yeah. And Tom is very familiar with having conversations with me when all of a sudden I stop and go, ooh, shiny. You know, and go chasing another rabbit down a rabbit hole. He he's gotten really good about entering notes to transcribe later. <laughs> We're talking about one of these. <laughs> I can can we I briefly talk difficult. about the can we briefly talk about the bad guys? Um, it, because it's such an interesting part of of a call to vengeance that you know I, I think it, it deserves touching on, especially Jeremiah Lynn. Uh, yeah, who, yeah, he's a piece of work. Yeah, piece of work. <laughs> Tim, Odious, the, Jeremiah's yours. <laughs> Tim? Huh, I wonder if Tim dropped out there. I have lost him. I hope not. You know, it's uh, difficult to continue the books without him. Um, well, okay. <laughs> Just to, to fill time before he gets back. Um, Jeremiah Lin, I'm not going to talk about because I want Tim to do that, but he is basically um, a, a hireling of the, the the faceless transstellar bad guys who have figured out that there is a wormhole and probably a fairly significant one in the vicinity of the Star Kingdom because they've been going back through the original survey data looking for different markers. 
Um, and so Jeremiah's job is to figure out how to put Star Kingdom of Manticore under new management that will then sign a concession to the Transtellar, giving them control of the wormhole for all intents and purposes. Hmm. And um, the Transtellar is owned by this fellow Axelrod. Well, that's the name. Of, that's the name of the Transtellar. Um, yeah. We haven't actually worked out as to, you know, I doubt that it has an owner at this point. This isn't like Klaus Hopman's cartel in Manticore, where he basically owns the whole shooting match. Uh, this is like, you know, just a huge mega corporation sprawling over multiple star systems. You know, it's a technology giant kind of thing. Oh, okay. um, yeah, it's more like it's more like dealing with um, Standard Oil in the nineteen. 19- 20s uh than it is dealing with the Hopman cartel in in uh, honors time um this is before standard was broken up uh by the trust busters in the in the 1920s um the transstellars in the honor verse was that tim coming back yeah sorry i don't know what happened i got disconnected well, okay. I told them that I was not going to talk about Jeremiah Lynn until you got back. We talked a little about Axelrod and what Axelrod is after. But Jeremiah is your work and a piece of work he is. So why don't you <laughs> tell us a little about him? <laughs> oh, he is just the most suave, uh, deadly... Uh, is special operative of Axelrod as you could ever come up with. Uh, so he he's a lot of fun. Um, he he's nasty, but he's very suave, and he's also very good at what he does. Mm-hmm. And I, I believe the term, if you looked up unscrupulous in the dictionary, you'd find his picture. Um, <laughs> very possible. Yeah, probably only a sketch. Uh-huh. I don't think the picture would he would let a picture be taken. Well, you might have the see the smile. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say that again. I'm sorry. You'd see the smile. That's all. Uh, his, his the, the Cheshire is, operative. Yeah, it's it's a his particular smile, is, smile that has caught Chomps' attention, and uh, it's his way of identifying Lynn through any disguise he might put on. And... Uh, Lynn doesn't know it, that he's yes. been ID'd that way. Yes, which I'm looking forward to the day when Lynn does discover that, and we will have to create a new villain, um, because I'm pretty sure what will happen. We're, <laughs> we're, we're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> well, it's not the only the, string the, in the back of Rod's bow. Yes. One of the fun things is about Lynn is that he's he's so smart and suave that when he runs up against like a, a complete straight shooter like Travis, he's he sometimes he's just flummoxed. He doesn't know what to do. Wait a minute, this guy is honest. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, I, the other thing about Lynn is Lynn is a victim of the fact that he's the smartest guy in the room and he knows it. Um, the whole scene, um, uh, without going into any details. Uh, when Travis comes up with a brilliant idea to revive an old tactic uh, early on in the book, Lynn thinks himself into defeat when he might have been able to pull a victory out. Would you say that's fair, Tim? Yes, very fair. Yeah. Um, and, And that's sort of Lynn's Achilles heel is the fact that he knows he's smarter than everybody else. And he's demonstrated it often enough by surviving that he has empirical evidence that he is. Um, and that's where he, I think, is eventually going to come a cropper, is that he's going to figure that means he's smarter than a bunch of hicks in Manticore um, and maybe find out that, well, they may be hicks and they may have been unsophisticated when you knew them, but they smart. Um, I, I you know, I well, I don't think we've decided, uh, if we have, I'm certainly not aware of it, exactly what ultimately happens to and with Lynn. I think that it's working its way through uh, in the storyline. Um, and that's good. Um, because I don't, you yeah, know, right now, I have no right idea. Right now, mostly, 
Right now, right now, mostly what we're doing is having him make enemies of pretty much everybody he runs into. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's not to love? I mean, here's the guy who's trying to destroy your star kingdom. He doesn't care how many people. Oh, and by the way, my, my, my cat's paws have become inconvenient, so let's arrange for them to all be killed. I mean, what's not yeah. to love a guy like that? <laughs> There is uh, one I, other uh, uh, bad, uh, not one other, but another bad group uh, is uh, headed by Jen Som, um and uh, uh, the the Volsung pirates, um, right? Yes, the, right. Volsung mercenaries. Well, Tim and Tom have done a, um, should I call it a novella or a big short story, which actually mm-hmm. explains yeah. where Jen Sung came from. Uh, that we uh, uh, hopefully will be getting into print somewhere sometime soon. Um, well, I'm waiting, explained... waiting on uh, waiting on Tom's final comments. I believe. waiting. Yeah, that's waiting. Waiting on me on okay. that one. Well, I was I was not going to say anything about that, given how far behind <laughs> I am on my current projects. You know, glass houses, stones, that whole thing. But um, it's um, the. Uh, it turns out that there's a much more, for want of a better term, incestuous relationship between Jin, between Jin Son and some major star nations uh, than people realize on the basis of what we've seen so far in the Travis stories. Um, and one of the things that this mysterious group that nobody knows who they are does is it compels Manticore to start reaching out to its interstellar neighbors, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And a huge part of this book is, is tied up in doing exactly that. And with the heartless, cold, heartless people that Tim and Tom are, I had nothing to do with this. They send Lisa and Travis in totally different directions <laughs> for most of the book. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like, deadly well, danger, though neither realizes it, of course. Yes, yes. And they're just as happy they didn't realize it later when they get back. You know, I'd have been worried about you. You know, although Lisa, Lisa has, I think, a marvelous line in there. I can't remember exactly how she puts it, but basically when she says, she says, oh, I wouldn't, wouldn't have been worried if I'd known what was going on with you because I would have known that you would have come up with some sort of brilliant off-the-wall notion to, make, to save the day, <laughs> uh, which shows that she has a firm grasp of Travis's, uh, Travis's character. Um, well, that obviously think, doesn't um, doesn't matter because they're not special friends. That's, that's special. true. That's <laughs> true. Of course, they they, <laughs> they are they're very special friends by the end of the book. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, yes. sorry, take that away. <laughs> uh, like nobody saw that coming for the last two <laughs> books. Um, one of the other things that's cool about Travis is that he finds himself against his almost against his will, uh, being pushed more and more into an intelligence officer's role as opposed to a tactical officer's role. And the big problem is that he's really good at both in his own precious Travis idiosyncratic way. Um, And so there's a, there's a, 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 a tension within him and his career that is is really kind of neat and is also part of the explanation of why he's not better known than he was uh because so much of what he was doing was involved with intelligence work that had to be kept quiet had kept confidential and so forth there's actually going to be a certain degree of pressure to keep him in the shadows even during his own lifetime to safeguard his effectiveness on the intelligence side um, but he's he's a very different character. Honor starts out sort of as a uh, a brilliant blunt instrument. Okay, she's this tactically brilliant officer who politically is horribly naive. Well, not naive, but she is. She sees no reason why politics should affect the way that she does her job, um, which is the way that it should be in some ways. 
but it's there's almost a uh, um, uh, an innocence on her part. She didn't want to get involved in politics at all, et cetera. And ultimately, of course, she's confidant to, to queens and empresses and presidents and whatnot. The, you know, one of the senior supreme political as well as military strategists of the Grand Alliance. Travis's career is similar. In the sense that he's not he's not interested in politics. I mean, you know, he's he's his brother is his half brother, so he's not in line for for Winterfell's seat, no matter what happens. Um, he's certainly not a member of the House of Lords. He's totally disinterested in politics, um, and he kind of falls into them the same way that Honor does. It's the 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 force of events. But they're going to have very different perspectives on the politics, I think. Mm. So uh, maybe as a way of wrapping up also, um, what what's next? Uh, what well, we could said, tell you I that, should... but then we'd have to kill you. <laughs> well, okay. what, 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 are, what are you all working we're, on? We're working on finalizing the outline for book four, A Call to Insurrection. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will say, all I'll say about it is that we will be seeing we will be seeing uh, further development of contacts that Travis established in this book um, as as part of what's going on in the next one, and we will see. That will have still ramifications more. all the way through. Is ramifications all the way through to t- to honors time. Yes, absolutely. Um, and we also will see more. Um, you, you, OK, you you know that we couldn't let things be domestically tranquil for the Star Kingdom. You know, we just I'm sorry. I thought about that. And I said, <laughs> nah, not going to happen. You know, uh, so there will be more goings on. Uh, on Manticore. And I will say that I am looking forward to what I think is going to happen with uh, Winterfell, uh, Travis's brother, Um, because basically Winterfell finds himself face to face with political expedience and his own career coming face to face with his responsibility and his duty. And he has to figure out how to resolve that question, um, which I think makes him one of the more interesting characters uh, in the book uh, in, in a lot of ways. He's, he's definitely grown as the series went along, both as an individual and in his importance to the storyline. And I think that's going to continue. Would you guys concur with that? Yes. Oh yeah. 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 His his character arc is be one of my favorites, just because he's not he's never been a a incredibly critical foreground character, but he's grown as much. And this is one of the things I love about Tim's writing is that. The, even the background characters have have character arcs and they grow and they have motivations. Mm-hmm. They're not just simply cutouts that are that are you know held up on sticks to, you know to to represent bad guy X or you know sympathetic ear Y. Um, and it's fun to really start to look and to dive into some of them and to see them more on camera and to to see some of those um, to see what I, what's been hinted at for for two or three books. Yeah. I think well, he has most... some very cool moments in Call of Vengeance as well. He's he becomes yeah, more he sympathetic. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Well, I think I think to me one of the one of the um, the best moments at all of all with Winterfell is when he's talking to his mother and realizes that he should have been listening to Travis more when Travis was younger because he finally begins to realize some things that he had never really suspected uh, about Travis's relationship with his mom. And he tries to do something about it. But in his own way, Winterfell is almost as as inept in interpersonal relations as Travis. Um, mm-hmm. 
he's a you know I, I don't think Winterfell would have been a successful politician if he hadn't been a member of the peerage. Mm. Okay. No, I'm sure. He didn't. But I think Tim, I think one of the things you've done with him is you've grown him to a point at which his success is going to be an outcome of his moral evolution. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm envisioning some place in the last book of Travis and his brother looking back on their careers and seeing how different and yet how much the same in many ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, there, and, and I... Okay. This is this is my own personal thought right this minute, and I have no idea of how well it will ultimately work into the story. And that's going to be more Tim and Tom's call than mine, to be honest. But the nature of their personal relationship, it's starting in such a bad place. <laughs> okay. I'm looking forward to seeing how it changes because the two of them, Winterfell is beginning to, to, to recognize what Travis has done, what he's accomplished and what he's risked. But Travis has not yet had an opportunity to see Winterfell doing the same thing before this book at any rate. Um, yeah. And it's going to be really interesting to see how these two half brothers, how their relationship works out as they become adults in the sense of taking moral responsibility for their own lives. Travis has already done that. Um, Winterfell, not so much, at least prior to this book. So I'm really going to be interested to see how that whole thing plays out. And we got, guys, we got to get Winterfell a girlfriend. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay. We gotta get him a girlfriend. Um and hopefully not one of Lynn's operatives. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, oh what tangle web you all weave in your uh in your fictional uh, house of lies. <laughs> you... Well Well I, I, I have to I have to say that one of the things that's a lot of fun about the collaboration is we do have mutual ooh shiny moments when we're talking about something. We'll go, hey, wait, what about this? What about that? In a way that you don't do when you're writing solo. Okay, when you're writing solo, you may stop and say, boy, wouldn't it be cool if, but it's almost more of of a subconscious stream of thought. Okay, when you're working with two collaborators whose judgment you respect and who really are into the, if you will, the source material for the for the literary universe, it's because you have to articulate the process. It's a more fully developed process, and I think that that is one of the one of the strengths of these books. Um, I've had people come up to me and say, well, I know why Honor did that. She did it because of thus and so and thus and such. And I realize, you know what, they're right. I didn't think about why she did it at the time because I just knew it was Honor and this is what she'd do. That's what I mean by the subconscious aspect of it. But when you have three folks and they're looking at it and they're saying, well, why did so-and-so do such and such? Or why didn't so-and-so do such and such? Um, it's like the 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 the, the, the uh, Travis Clegg relationship. Um, we we looked at that from a bunch of different angles, and I think ultimately the fact that we brought so many viewpoints to it and we had to articulate our positions to one another mean that those two characters are much more richly drawn, at least in their relationship to one another, than they would have been by any of the three of us in isolation. Well, maybe that is a great place to leave it. Um, And uh, the book that is the result of this amazing collaboration is out now. It's A Call to Vengeance. It's at booksellers everywhere. A Call to Vengeance by David Weber and Timothy Zahn with Thomas Pope. Um, David, Tim, and Tom, thank you so much for uh, sharing all this, uh, this great insight into A Call to Vengeance. 
Thank you, Tom. Well, you know, we we hate on. talking about our work. We hate talking about our work. Yeah. We understand that. <laughs> it was a huge sacrifice for us. Uh, thanks for giving us a chance to. That was part two of a two-part interview with David Weber, Timothy Zahn, and Thomas Pope discussing new entry in the Manticore Ascendant series, A Cult of Vengeance. Part one of the interview is available on last week's podcast. This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, a Leiden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior, and challenged at every turn by opportunists on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corville desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corville's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mount an armed attacks on others of Corval's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corville's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age and perhaps her very life is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. Will you share a glass of wine with me, daughter? Patty blinked and sat up, startled. They had dined privately in their suite, all three together. After, Mr. Higgs had excused himself to his room. The headache had faded again over the course of the meal, and Patty had been content merely to sit for a moment or two, treasuring both the absence of pain and the absence of any necessity to introduce herself or, indeed, to speak at all. Except she must have dozed off, and that would never do. She and Father still had the gathered keys to sort through and a port itinerary to make, after which she would study for a few hours before bed. Forgive me, she managed, to Father's uplifted eyebrows. I hadn't meant to fall asleep. The day has scarcely been free of stress, Father said, repeating what he had said at the reception. I find the gravity a trifle wearisome myself. I offer again, daughter, will you share a glass of wine? Father had stopped at the duty-free shop in the lobby of their hotel to purchase a bottle of the local summer wine, and had set it on the wine table in their suite. Patty had supposed he would have a glass while they worked. He most usually had a glass of wine to hand, and had given it no more thought than that. But I see that you are a little timid of a green vintage, Father said, in the face of her continued silence. Allow me to reassure you, based upon my sampling at your reception. I found it bright and balanced. A very pleasant little wine, and unlikely to produce any more lethargy than we already enjoy. We must, of course, assume that the bottle has not been mistreated, but I believe we may reasonably suppose that to be the case. That was merely nonsense, of course. Words to fill time and allow her to gather her thoughts. Plainly, Father was not intending to resume work after the meal. Father wished to speak with his daughter and his heir between kin, which was certainly not a proposition she could or wanted to decline. She did wonder if she had erred in some grievous manner during the walk from the reception to the hotel, and which necessitated this change of plans. 
But there was a very easy way, after all, to discover that. Patty inclined her head. Thank you, father. I would be pleased to share wine and a moment with you. It is pleasant, she exclaimed, essaying another sip and sighing. What a pity that... She swallowed the rest of what she had been about to say, feeling her cheeks warm. Really, Paddy, this is not a trade session, she told herself. Strive for some conduct. Father grinned at her over the rim of his wine cup. Difficult, isn't it? But don't despair. Couching all and everything in terms of trade and profit is a positive sign of progress toward your goal. I swear so to you, as your grandfather once swore to me. According to those tales she had heard of him, Grandfather Ertom had not been much given to joking. He had, however, been rather incisively ironic. We have, she pointed out, a little more sharply than was perhaps entirely proper, been trading all day. Indeed we have, but now we must adopt another mode, if you will allow me. He shifted somewhat in his chair and stretched out a long arm to place the wine cup on the table between them. They sat side by side, in matching upholstered chairs by the suite's large window, overlooking Langlest Port and the mountains beyond. Paddy put her glass on the table also and inclined her head formally. You wished to speak with me, father? Excellent. You set the tone well. In fact, my child, I do wish to speak with you. More, I wish to ask you a question. It is a question I now feel that I ought to have asked long since. But better tardy, so it is said, than never arrive. He paused. Paddy waited. Father sighed and moved a hand. Pilot talk for straightest route possible. I wish you to tell me, please, daughter, what happened at Runig's Rock? Paddy blinked. Happened? Nothing happened which was the intent, as I understood it. We had our lessons, and we walked our rounds, we exercised, played cards, and read. Silvor drew. The twins slept. Oh, she put her fingers against her lips, recalling one thing that had happened, and about which they had not considered it wise to be forthcoming. Grandfather Lucan knew, of course, and, well, Perhaps Quinn had told his father, now that they were home and it hardly mattered anymore. Still, it had been an infraction. They had disobeyed Grandfather Lucan and Cousin Corrine, as well as violating systems. But don't keep me in suspense, Father urged. What is this one thing that happened? Well, Quinn had been distressed for Cousin Patrin. We had news from time to time of you and the passage and Aunt Nova, but it was as if Cousin Patrin had simply fallen away into the star fields. Because, after all, Father said, after she had paused for a moment to collect her thoughts, that was what he was supposed to have done. Well, yes, certainly, but Father, you know Quinn. He's made of nerves, so I said to him that we might look at the check-in list. Both of father's eyebrows rose. Did you? he murmured. Yes, sir. I thought it would ease him. We, well, I, circumvented the codes so that he could check the list. I broke nothing, and we put everything back as it had been when we were done. But the point is, which is to say, what happened is that he found that his father had not checked in, not at all, not even once. I can scarcely suppose that this was the comfort you had hoped to offer Kin, father said, reaching for his wine cup. 
How did Quinn go on after that? Pretty well, that is, he spoke with Grandfather, who of course scolded him for listening at doors. Then he pointed out that Cousin Patrin was not a fool and would therefore not endanger himself by foolish action. If checking in would expose him to enemies, then surely he would fail to check in. And that comforted Quinn, did it? It did, yes. Well then, the episode seems to have ended well, though I regret that an action of yours stirred Lucan into sternness. He does so dislike being stern. Yes, Paddy said. Was he also stern to you? No, father. I think that Quinn did not tell him I had helped with the codes. There was a small pause, followed by a light sigh. Ah, well, a pilot must have a care for his co-pilot after all, especially when there is only one available. Yes, she said again, and sighed herself, leaning back into the chair. She did not close her eyes. She had already disgraced herself once by falling asleep after dinner. It would scarcely do to fall asleep again in the middle of a conversation. Though, now that father had the answer to his question, perhaps... Forgive me, he said, interrupting her train of thought, that I am not specific. I have nothing to lead me, save this stone edifice with which you increasingly distress your elders, the maintenance of which appears to be taking a very great deal of your energy. What happened, child? that you felt you must create such a thing. She caught her breath. I thought I had hidden it, she whispered. I, does it hurt you? I never thought. She hadn't thought. Why should she have thought? What her construct might feel like to heal her senses. She blinked away sudden tears. I have control enough that it does not hurt me, though it occasionally surprises and dismays me, father said softly. In fact, I will make bold to say that it hurts and has hurt you far more grievously than it may ever hurt me. He leaned over to put his hand on her knee. Paddy, why? His voice was gentle. She saw concern in his face, felt tenderness in the touch of his hand. Love swelled in her throat, choking her, and then the tears came, faster than she could blink them away. She reached for the small dance she had made in her head, meaning to lock the shame away with the rest of it, and... Do not! The command rocked her back into her chair. It took the breath from her lungs. She gasped for air and bent forward, her face hidden against her knees as the tears flowed, hot and shameful. I was afraid, she managed, her voice shaking. Oh, father, I am such a coward. And that was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And an entire universe made of memory foam squished down to Big Bang density and released to expand back into the shape of a birthday cake. Or maybe that's a pie. Or a spider with a horse's saddle on its back. Hard to say at this point. Plus, thanks, gratitude, and plaudits galore to David Weber, Timothy Zahn, and Thomas Pope, authors of A Call to Vengeance. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs> <laughs>